Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jared. Um, it's good to see so many of you here. I'm recording. I am recording, yes. Um, so welcome to this introduction to Swift. So to get started, I just wanted to justify quickly why I wanted to do this talk on Swift, why um, I think it's useful. So many of you might know Swift as the Apple language, right? Um, it's, it's, uh, there's no denying that it is the modern language for Apple platforms. Uh, and the momentum it has there is going to mean that it's going to stick around uh, for Apple platforms. But also, uh, hopefully not just for Apple platforms, because Swift is open source, as you may know. So if you go to swift.org, uh, you'll see that the Swift compiler and the Swift uh, standard library and core libraries are available as uh, open source projects on GitHub, uh, which is quite exciting. Uh, the other thing is that Swift is quite a new language. You know, uh, it's only uh, a few years old, and that means that you have uh, an opportunity in that, you know, there's lots of things that can still be, uh, there's lots of work still to be done on Swift. And, you know, it's not out of the question for even um, beginners to help out with some of these projects. Uh, and last but not least, it is becoming a very employable skill as it becomes more popular as a language. Cool, so in this workshop, I'm gonna be talking about Swift outside of the Apple context. So I'm gonna try and prove to you that Swift is a language in its own right, and it's a useful um, general purpose language. Uh, you can create more than just iOS apps, you can create very uh, interesting command line tools and server side apps as well with Swift. Uh, I'm gonna show you some of the Swift syntax and some of the language features, and we're also gonna talk about Swift Package Manager, uh, and you'll see what that is later on. Uh, cool, so I just want to mention quickly, this is the website you want to go to for the uh, reference for the Swift standard library. Okay, so developer.apple.com slash reference slash Swift has um, all the information you might need to know about Swift. Admittedly, not in the best format, but it is all there one way or another. Um, but hopefully we can decipher some of that today. Okay, if you want to follow along, uh, I'm going to make available my code and my terminal live for you. So I'm going to be switching between my uh, code and my terminal. And, uh, you know, if I switch at the wrong time, you might want to see the code that I've written. And if you want to do that, just go to this link, uh, flubits.com slash hackers at Cambridge slash Swift. Um, that looks something like this. And you'll be able to see my terminal here. Uh, that's going to follow everything I do, and you'll also be able to see uh, all the code that I write. Okay. So, uh, and if you want to use that, you want, you want to do it on Chrome because Safari is not very good at it. Okay, great. So, without further ado, let's start using Swift. So, there's a few ways you can run Swift. Uh, the top one here is the REPL mode. REPL is uh, an acronym for Read, Evaluate, Print Loop. So uh, if you run Swift in your command line, you'll see exactly what it does. Uh, it, just, it just gives you, um, well, I'll show you what it does in a minute. There's also two other modes. So you can run Swift in interpreted mode or compiled mode when you want to run a Swift file. So um, <coughs> interpreted mode, you just write Swift and then the file name. Uh, and what that's going to do is it's going to run each line of your, of your Swift file uh, one at a time. Okay? Uh, the compiled mode is going to look at your entire file and compile it into an executable. Uh, and here, so we're saying Swift compile, Swift C, then the file that we want to compile, then uh, this O, so that's the output file, and then we're calling the output file test here. right? And then we run that output file, uh, which is an executable. Okay, so let's have a look at that. So um, what we're going to do is going to go to our terminal. And first of all, let's look at this REPL, right? So if we just type Swift here, a bit of a delay, and then it's going to open up the Swift REPL. So in here, we can, we can type Swift statements. We can say, uh, so this is, how, this is how you print something in, in Swift. And it will run it uh, for you line by line. Okay, so that, that's, that's a useful thing to know if you just want to try something out quickly. Uh, to get out of that, you just press Control D. All right. Uh, and now let's, let's make a Swift file and then run the Swift file so that we, we know how to do that. So uh, I'm going to make a new, um, new directory here. 
I'm going to call this um, intro, as this is the intro to the workshop. Uh, I'm going to move into that directory. And then I'm just going to make a new file. You can make a new file however, however you make a new file on your system. But I'm going to make a file called uh, tests, uh, what shall I call it, intro.swift. OK, so uh, and in here, I'm just going to write the same thing again. <coughs> So this, as we know, is a valid piece of Swift code. Uh, and we're going to save that to intro.swift. So now you can see we've got that file ready. To run that file, uh, if we go back to uh, the slides here, uh, in interpreted mode, we just type swift test.swift. <coughs> okay. Oops. Ah, intro intro.swift. Okay, and we'll see that's running. And we can also compile it. So if we go swift c intro.swift uh, and then specify an output file. So again, here we're, we're saying, can you all see this, by the way? I'll make it a bit bigger. Um, so I'm specifying this output file uh, intro. So it's going to make an executable called intro. You can see that there. And to execute it, we just say dot slash intro. OK, everyone happy with that? Great. Let's move on, let's do something more interesting than saying hello. Uh, so let's start by getting a little bit more comfortable with Swift, OK? Let's look at some of the things we know and love from other languages, how we can do those things in Swift. Let's start simple. We're just going to set some values. So Swift has the, uh, the concept of both constant values and variable values, OK? So uh, we want to we use constants <coughs> where we can. So we, to do that, we say let name equals, uh, we say let and then the name of the variable and then, um, then whatever you want the value to be. And that is a constant, so if you try and re uh, assign a new value to that, that's going to fail. Okay. Uh, we also have variables, of course, if you do need to change the value at some point. Then you can say, uh, you say var, and then the name that you want your variable to take. And you give it a value, and then you can reset that value later on. Okay. Um, so you'll notice in both of these cases, we haven't given Swift any type information. What Swift has done in these cases is said, OK, well, you've given uh, name a string, so I know that name is of type string. right? But if, in this case uh, here, we're declaring this uh, constant, but we're not giving it a value, so we need to explicitly give it a type. Does that make sense? So we're saying let title. Uh, so we're declaring a constant called title, and we're giving it a type of string. And then later on, we give it a value, with a string value. Any questions about that? <coughs> cool. So you can declare an immutable variable and then assign place? You can. It can only be assigned once. Um, and it's a good question. So if you try and do this in the REPL, uh, it will say, no, you can't do that, because um, you know it's going to try and make the constant without a, ver without, without a value, which isn't going to work. Um, but in a compiled file, you can do that. Okay. Cool. So let's talk about arrays quickly. So um, in other languages, you might be used to this sort of thing, where you say, OK, I'm going to make a variable um, called int array, and then I'm going to use some miscellaneous punctuation, and going to say, that is an array of integers with a fixed size. Okay, That's not what we do in Swift. There's no fixed size to arrays in Swift. So here in Swift, we can, we can uh, declare an array just by saying uh, our int array is of type uh, int array. So this is how we, we denote an int array in Swift. And then we can, we can set that value. And we can also append to arrays just with a plus equals operator, which is pretty cool. So equally, we didn't we didn't have to leave the value out here. We could have put we could have put this array in here, and Swift would have inferred for us that int array is of type int array. Okay, any questions about that much? Um, do you know what the underlying representation of that is? Okay. Yeah, so we were talking about this the other day actually. So in in Swift, uh, arrays are stored contiguously, so it is contiguous data. Um, an int uh, uh, sorry, an array will have um, it will have a, uh, a capacity. And if you fill that array to that capacity, it will expand itself. 
Uh, but it will always be stored contiguously. So it has like a size and a capacity, so it's got like a length, which is like the length of the array as you're interacting with it, and then a capacity, which is the amount of memory that's been made available for it. Yeah. So are you able to explicitly tell it what capacity you want when you initialize it? No, you're not. Okay, so let's move on. Let's talk about um, some control flow mechanisms. So you're all used to for loops from other languages. So you might be used to this idiom where we say for and then we initialize some variable, right? Uh, so for in this example, we've done int i equals zero. And then we give the for loop some condition and then some, um, some increment and we, we execute statements while that condition holds. So that's a little bit messy, I feel. In Swift, we do something that's a bit more like what we mean. Um, we say for i in, and then this uh, funky range syntax. So you can read this as for i in the range from 0 up to n exclusive. But I just wanted to show you this, this syntax. This is how you make a for loop in Swift. Cool. The other thing I want to show you is the switch statement. So here we are, we are making some, <coughs> some constant that we're calling favorite food. And that's going to be of type string. And then we can do a switch on that, on that uh, constant. So what we're doing here is we're saying uh, switch on favorite food. And then it's going to look through the possible cases of what favorite food might be, right? So um, <coughs> this, is, this might be familiar to some of you from other languages. So here we've, we're looking at the case um, where, the, where the favorite food is salad. And we're saying, um, yeah, nobody likes a liar. Uh, yeah. And we're looking at the case where there's candy floss, etc. And we also provide a default case. So together, these three cases cover all the possible uh, cases for what this string favorite food could be. Um, if we didn't provide that default case, Swift is going to say, OK, well, I know favorite food is a string, but uh, a string can be more than just salad or a candy floss. So maybe uh, you want to consider adding a default clause because those uh, cases are not exhaustive. And actually, Swift won't let you compile that code. All right. Does that make sense? <coughs> Go ahead. So with Swift, if you don't put in um, like a break, will it continue evaluating the case statement? Uh, no, it won't. So in Swift, uh, just this is just a syntax thing. If, uh, so in other languages, you might need to put in a break statement here. You don't need to do that in Swift. So when it sees a new case, it will uh, it will stop. OK. Happy? Awesome. Um, let's also look at functions, and then we'll jump into a bit of a demo. <laughs> so the function syntax in Swift is uh, we use the func keyword, and then we give our function a name. And then we give our function some parameters. So here, we've given it a parameter with a name of number and a type of int. We also use this uh, arrow syntax for the return type. Uh, and in this case, our return type is bool. Okay, and uh, we're using the return keyword. And so yeah, that, that's that's pretty much what you might expect from other languages. Um, any questions about that? Okay, great. So let's jump into a demo. Um, I'm going to go back to my intro.swift here, and let's make a function. Let's make a function that tests if a number is prime, okay? Just to, just to show some of these features of Swift. So we're going to make uh, func is prime, and that's going to take a parameter that's going to be a number, okay? Uh, and so that's going to be of type int, and then it's going to have a return type of bool, right? We want to say true or false, is this number prime? Okay? Uh, in our definition of prime numbers, we're going to say that no negative numbers are prime, and one is not prime. Uh, and so if the number is less than two, we will say it's not prime. So if okay, um, and the way we do if statements is we just say number less than two. Okay. Notice the distinct lack of semicolons in this Swift code, and the lack of extraneous brackets. Okay, so in in, in other <laughs> languages you might you might need these round brackets. In in Swift you don't need those because it's kind of unambiguous. Okay, so um, 
once we know that the number is, is uh, two or, or <coughs> greater than two, let's check it with all its divisors to see if it's prime. So check all divisors up to number. And we're going to use this for syntax. So we say for uh, divisor in the numbers from two up to number. Uh, if the divisor divides the number, then we're going to return false. Okay. If, uh, so that we're just saying here, if the remainder when number is divided by divisor is zero, then we're going to return false because that number divides the number and hence it can't be prime. Okay. <coughs> if it gets through all those, we're going to say uh, must be prime. Okay, happy with that? So let's see if we can run that. So I'm going to say swift, uh, it's called intro.swift. And okay, so I haven't used the function. So let's use the function. Um, you here? Not you. What's your favorite prime number? 13. So let's try print is prime 13. And Tom, what's your favorite composite number? Um, 218. Okay. So with any luck, that's going to say true, for, uh, true and then false. Uh, I've actually messed this up here. So when we call a function, we need to give it the parameter name, right? Okay. So now if we run that again, we'll see, yep, 13 is a prime and 218 is not a prime. Easy, huh? Um, okay, so this, uh, this thing here, putting number in here seems a bit cumbersome, right? Um, maybe we could make this a bit clearer. So in Swift, we have, uh, functions have both the idea of a parameter name and an argument label. I'm going to try and explain the difference between those two things now. So let's say we had some function um, send message and that message was, uh, w that, that function takes a message which is a, which is a string and a recipient which is, uh, I don't know, some, some type called recipient. So say we had that and then when we're calling that so say this is the implementation here. And then when we're calling that, we, we would be calling it like this. Um, right, which is, which is okay, but maybe it's not as concise as it could be. What if we could do something like this? And say two, like that. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be a bit more concise and bit, it would read a bit more like what we intended to do. So actually in Swift we can do that. So you'll see that these do not match the, the uh, parameter names that we've set here. Uh, oops. Um, but that doesn't matter. What we can actually do is we can say send message and we can give, um, we can give both parameter names uh, and argument labels. So what we can do is set two to the argument label and recipient to the parameter name. Okay, so watch this. I'm going to do that. Okay, and if we don't want to have this um, perhaps uh, unnecessary message label here, we can put an underscore as the argument label and then we don't need to put that in the call. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Um, no, so uh, actually, despite being named, all the parameters still have to be given in order to a function. So you can have multiple arguments with no label. Okay. Cool. So in this case, now we can we can use this kind of concise syntax, which 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 reads very nicely. So Swift has this. Uh, recurring theme of clarity at the point of use. That's one of its aims. 
I think this this syntax goes some way to to achieving that. So let's modify our is prime signature here to not require this argument label, and then we can ditch our uh, number label, and this will still happily work. Okay. Any questions about that? Cool. Uh, where were we? Excellent. So I want to talk quickly about uh, classes and structures uh, in Swift and also enumerations, and you'll see what those are in just a moment. Uh, so classes, uh, many of you might be familiar with objects-oriented programming, and Swift, of course, does have a concept of uh, classes and objects. So in this case, what we're doing is we're defining a student class, and we're defining some stored properties on that class, right? We're saying, okay, it's going to have a name, which is constant, and it has a, a, a sort of a string type. And the student also uh, has a tripos part, which might change at some point, but that's also a string. Um, and we can declare methods on, on classes so students can read, uh, you would hope. We can also make uh, initializers on the class um, pretty much how you'd expect. So they're just functions with a special name called init. And uh, then you can use this syntax. So notice the use of the keyword self here. So self.name uh, refers to the stored property name, and name uh, refers to the parameter name. Does that make sense? Go ahead. Uh, if let's say you didn't have the naming conflict, would you have to put self? There? No. So self, the, this self dot thing is only necessary when there's an ambiguity. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, and then we can instantiate a class like this. <clears throat> Again, pretty much what you'd expect. So what we're doing here is we're calling our init function that we defined just by saying the name of the class and then opening um, this call here. Does that make sense? Yeah? <coughs> cool. Uh, and then we can, we can use methods on the class uh, just with this dot syntax. So for example, richard.read. Cool. Uh, I also want to talk about structures. Um, so structures are kind of similar to classes in Swift, and we'll talk about their differences in a moment, but we can also declare stored properties on structs, <coughs> and we can also declare initializers on structs, okay, a uh, very similar way to before. We can also even declare methods on a struct, and we even initialize them and uh, play with them in the same way. Okay, so what is actually the difference between a struct and a class? Well, um, I'm going to use these, these uh, the scary terms value versus reference semantics. <laughs> so um, a struct has value semantics, a class has reference semantics. What does that mean? OK, so remember we made um, instructor here uh, a class. So we made this, this struct instructor. Um, yeah, we made instructor a struct. So um, say we instantiate instructor, and we give him a name and, and a course that he's lecturing in, and then we try to copy his value to another uh, instructor. Okay, So we're saying var other instructor equals hal. Uh, now what do we expect that to do? Well, probably we expect that to copy this, copy hal, and then we can uh, modify other instructor. You know, we can change the module or whatever. And hal is untouched. Does that make sense? So we, we, we've seen a copy there. With reference semantics, it's a bit different. So say we make a student, so remember we made student a class. Say we make a student, uh, in this case he's called Richard, we give him a name of Richard and tripos part of 1B, and then we make uh, another <coughs> student, we call him other Richard, and assign him to what we think is the value of Richard. So what's actually happening here is Richard is a reference to an instance of student. So when we, when we uh, assign Richard to other Richard, we're actually just copying the reference. So other Richard and Richard are pointing to the same object, right? Uh, and when, when we try to modify other Richard, we're actually uh, modifying Richard as well. Was that a bit waffly? Uh, that makes sense? <coughs> OK, go ahead, Tom. So I'm guessing, so reference semantics is like, it would, would work basically like Java. Mm. And then the value semantics is like C. But the quick quick question: If you let's say use the let syntax on a struct, yeah, can you still change the member variables? No, you can't. You can't. No. So uh, if you use let with a value type, mm -hmm. then you can't change it. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> okay. Any other questions about that? Is 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 it actually a reference to something on the heap, or is it? It is, yeah. So if, it, if it's a class, it is actually a reference to something on the heap. 
So if you pass it to a method, it would pass the reference rather than the actual copying it into. Yeah, correct. Cool. Go ahead. So I'm presuming are the value um, instances on the stack? Yes, they are. Um, yeah, so we usually prefer structs where possible. Uh, so default to structs, and then use classes if um, if it doesn't make sense to be copying these things around whenever you are trying to move them from place to place, right? Maybe they're um, particularly big. Maybe they maybe they um, maybe it doesn't make make sense to copy them because they refer to something that uh, there should only be one uh, you know outlet to. Um, also, if for those of you who are familiar with object-oriented programming. Uh, use classes if you need inheritance. So structs can't do inheritance, um, whereas classes can. Any other questions about structs and classes? Cool. Uh, I also want to talk about extensions here. So extensions in Swift allow you to add functionality to any type that's available to you. So here we're uh, extending a string. It turns out in, in Swift a string is a struct. And we're adding a function to the string. Um, called is palindrome, and that's going to return true if if the string is a palindrome. So if its reverse is the same as itself, right? Uh, and you can see we would use that just by um, just by using that on an instance of string. So here we're saying hello is palindrome, and of course that's false because hello is not equal to ole. And uh, race car is palindrome is true because race car is a palindrome. Any questions about extensions? <coughs> Go ahead. How, how is that like um, imported into another file set? So the extension, um, I'm not going to talk very much about access control in this workshop, but the uh, extension by default has uh, internal access control, which means it's available anywhere within the module where you uh, create it. But you can also make it public, or you can make it uh, file private, or whatever you like. So yeah. It depends, is the answer. Go ahead. Does the equals equals operator always work with strings? Like, no matter where you declare it? Um, so, could you expand on that question? So, like, in Java, then it doesn't always work. You've got to use dot equals. equals yeah. Equals. yeah. So, in Swift, strings are value types, and you can use dot, um, equals equals to compare them. So, if you use equals equals on a reference type, like a class, would that just be comparing the references and not the actual class instances? Uh, good question. I'm not sure. I think probably it compares the references. <laughs> Any other questions about that? If you do it on a value type, does it compare the values in each of its variables, or does it just compare whether they're the same type? Uh, no. So if if you say we had our our instructor struct, if you had two instructors and you said Struct, um, instructor one equals equals instructor two, it would actually look at uh, all the content of both of those instructors. So you can basically treat a, a, a value type as just a bunch of bits and you're just comparing them, which is pretty cool, I think. Okay, um, so, okay, go ahead, Tom. So just clarifying, equals equals will always compare the values of what you're comparing, even if they're classes. Even if they're classes. Like if there's a, a triples equals operator where you put equals 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 and that will compare the references of two things. Interesting. Okay. Um, okay, so let's do a quick demo of extensions. <coughs> so, um, so we've got to this point where we're saying is prime. Uh, of a number, which is nice, but maybe it would be cooler if we could um, if we could write this call as something that you know would would read as if it's a statement that evaluates the true or false. So, um, so for example, um, the statement thirteen is prime is true, right? Uh, so maybe we can make it read a bit more like that. So um, we can do that with extensions. So we can say extension, uh, we're going to extend the int type. Uh, int it happens is a struct in Swift. Okay, and we're going to add a function here, um, which we're going to call is prime. And we're just going to copy our implementation of is prime. So we don't need this uh, number parameter that we had up here because we're just going to we're just going to be running the function on the instance of, of int that we have. 
All right, so now we can replace number everywhere with self. So self is that keyword that we saw earlier that, re that refers to the, the current instance. Um, and okay, so that should be happy. So let's now try um, these examples again. But this time, we're going to use the function in the extension. So to do that, we just say 13 dot is prime. So 13 is an instance of int, and then we're calling the function is prime on 13. And likewise, we can do it with any instance of int. Okay, let's see how that goes. Oh, I've messed it up. Um, so I forgot to add our return type to the is prime. All right. Is that cool? Any questions about extensions? Excellent. Um, so now I want to talk about enumerations in Swift. Um, if you've come from other languages, you might be used to this idiom. So you have to express some group of possible values for a certain uh, concept. So for example, we have um, the suit of a playing card here. And you might have seen people do something like this. So they have some some named constants and they have unique, say, integer values and then you assign them to something later on. So you might have seen that before, but obviously that is yucky because the as far as the compiler knows, Ace of Spades suit is just an integer, right? These values are all integers. And if at some point in your code later on you rely on Ace of Spades suit being one of these four values, then actually um, you know you can't rely on that from from the inferred type because they could be any integer, um, which which isn't ideal. So in Swift we have this idea of enums. So uh, you could say enum card suit, and we're specifying the four cases for a card suit. So we're saying spades, clubs, hearts, diamonds, and then we can we can uh, use those like this. Okay. So now the compiler knows that ace of spades suit, because it's of type card suit, um, or it's any, any value of type um, card suit can only be one of these four values. Uh, and to demonstrate that, you can use uh, an enum in a switch statement. And notice before, we had to add the default case. Remember that from before, um, where you had to add the default case to make sure the cases were exhaustive. Uh, with an enum, where it can only take one of these four values, we can actually say, we can actually just have cases for the four values and the compiler knows that they cover all the possible cases and it's not going to complain about uh, lack of exhaustivity in this case. Does that make sense? Excellent. Um, and actually, because, because here the compiler knows that uh, self is a card suit, we don't need to say card suit every time, we can just shorten it to, to uh, dot spades, etc., which is kind of nice. Okay, um, enumerations can also associate values with each of these cases. So here is some code that um, is from a real project that I did. So this this was a project that looks at the prices of menu items, and those prices either had a value. Uh, uh, you know, it, it would have a price, or it could be unconfirmed. You know, it could be some some special where the price is up on the blackboard and, and not not yet defined. Um, so what I've done here is I've made a price enumeration, which is either a value and it has an integer value associated with it. Uh, say that's the integer <coughs> number of pennies in in the price, or it was unconfirmed. So for example. Um, uh, let's say we let the caviar price equal lots of pennies. So we say price dot value, and then we, <coughs> we give it the associated integer value. Or the soup of the day price might be unconfirmed because we don't know what the soup of the day is going to be, perhaps. And we say price dot unconfirmed. Does that make sense? So that's pretty cool, I think. So so then we can use that associated value. So in our switch statement, what we've done is we've said case uh, dot value. So in the case that it's the value case of the price type. Then we're going to we're going to match the uh, integer that is associated with the with the value case, and then we can we can uh, return it in here. Okay, so th this this backslash syntax, by the way, is just how you uh, include a, a value in a string in Swift. Is that clear? 
question. So, what, so for example, you've got like a let x there. Like what does the let mean in that? Yeah, so the let is just, um, the let is binding x to the value that's associated with the case. Yeah. Okay. So this is, a, this is basically uh, pattern matching, but we use the let to do the binding. All right. Another yeah. question. So for example, if we wanted to like, you know, get all um, prices which are less than 100, so we want to do a switch statement, and you wanted a case where if the price was less than 100, would you be able to do that? Um, like, can you pattern match on the actual value of it? Uh, that's a good question. I, I believe you can, um, but we'd have to put some thought into that. Maybe we can look at that later on. Okay. Um, okay, so let's do another quick demo of um, using enumerations. So maybe let, we want to add some sort of classifier to our is prime thing here. So let's, uh, let's define a number class, right? And maybe we have a few cases of this. It could be, uh, it could be a prime number or it could be a composite number. Um, or it could be less than two, in which case, um, you know, all bets are off. Okay, and uh, so what we could do is we could we could add a classifier to the extension that we've made. So we could say, func. Okay, let's classify, uh, and that's going to return a number class. Oops. Cool. And we're going to say, uh, if self is less than two, then I'm just going to return uh, number class dot less than two. Okay. Uh, otherwise, if self is prime, then I'm going to return number class dot prime. And otherwise, um, it's a composite, right? It's, it's something that's greater than two and isn't prime, so it's a composite. So I'm going to say number class dot uh, composite. OK. Um, and again, because the compiler knows that the return type is going to be uh, a number class, we don't actually need to say number class in all these cases. We, could just, we can just say dot, dot less than two, et cetera. OK, so let's have another go at that. So we're going to say print uh, 13 dot classify and print 218 dot classify I think you can spell composite for the return oh yeah composite <laughs> good okay uh, okay maybe, may, maybe I've made some more mistakes we'll see uh, and then let's also try uh, 0 dot classify see what happens uh, cool. Uh, I okay. So because we're running in interpreted mode, actually we need to declare all the classes before we actually use them because they're running line by line, right? So let's let's move that back up here and try again. And we'll see we have a prime and a composite and a less than two. Is everyone happy with extensions? <coughs> so if you want in interpreted mode, would that be fine then? In, in compiled mode, yes, it would be fine. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Henry. Um, yes, you do. You can have static functions. Yeah. Um, so I believe it's you would just um, you just say uh, static func. Um, Say hello, and then you could do something like this, and we could do down here int dot. Hopefully, we can do this. Otherwise, this will be embarrassing. Uh, say hello, and then it will. Okay. okay. So it, it also infers that the return type is. I don't know what you call it. It's just void or unit. Sorry. Does that also infer then the return type is just unit? Does it infer that the, the return type is void? Yes, it does. So if if you don't, well, if you if you don't give it a return type, then you're saying explicit, you're saying that the return type is void. Okay, um, it won't it won't ever infer a type of a function. 
uh, it's just saying if, if you haven't given it a return type, then it doesn't return anything. OK. <coughs> cool. Uh, so yeah, so let's move on. Uh, now I want to talk about optionals. So optionals are quite a, an interesting feature of Swift. So this is for cases where um, you have some, uh, some variable that might have a value or it might not. For, so for in, this, in this case, we have uh, Richard's true love. Richard may or may not have a true love, and in this case, he does not. Um, but we have given him a type of true love. So this, this is, say, we, say we're working in another language here. So we've, we've said that Richard's love is of type true love, uh, but we haven't given it a value. And then later on, we have to remember to check that it has a value if we want to use Richard's love. Um, so, so here we're saying if Richard's love equals null, then, then ignore this. Otherwise, we're going to send, send roses to Richard's love. But if we forget to check for null and we try to send roses to Richard's love where there is no value in Richard's love, then um, everything is going to catch fire and you'll have uh, an angry del de delivery man. So, um, so this is unsafe code, what you might call unsafe code, in that you're depending on the programmer to remember to check for null. The, the compiler has no idea that uh, this variable might not have a value in it. In Swift, what we can say is um, we're going to let Richard's love be of type true love question mark. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is us saying to the compiler, this is an optional true love. That means it, it's, it's of type true love, but it may not have a value, right? Um, and in this case, it does not. We're setting it equal to nil. And then to use Richard's love, the compiler is, uh, as, as, as I say, it knows that it might not have a value, so it makes us uh, check. So what we do is we do this, what's called an optional binding. We say if you can bind recipient to Richard's love, that is if let recipient equals Richard's love. So if there is a value in Richard's love that we can give to recipient, then make recipient um, so recipient is now within here, recipient is of type non-optional true love. Okay, does that make sense? So um, if there was a value, we're going to enter this if block and we're going to send roses to our recipient. Otherwise, we won't enter this block and we can, we can equally have an else block here if we like. Okay, and if we forget to check, then the compiler is going to shout at us and save the day. All right, any questions about optionals? So let's look at how you can work with optionals. So we've seen the optional binding, right? But we can also, there's a few other things we can do. Uh, we can also have a default value for, for an optional. So say we want to, we have an optional and we want to get some non-optional thing out of it. We can set a default value. So here we're just saying uh, Richard's love, we're using this question mark, question mark operator and um, giving it a default value. Okay, so if Richard's love has a value, that's going to go to definite love. If it doesn't, then this default value is going to go to definite love. So either way, definite love is of type non-optional true love in this case. Um, we can also force unwrap. So there might be some situations where you know without the shadow of a doubt that um, uh, despite uh, a variable being of type optional, that there is going to be a value in there. Okay, uh, And in those cases, you can force unwrap it with this exclamation mark here. OK, so let's um, have a demo of optionals now. Go ahead, question Tom. Are uh, optionals basically like a shorthand for an enum? Yeah, they are. had one value, and that value had a type, and then, or, and then uh, yeah. think, oh, okay, it's so a nil. They actually are. So to demonstrate that, actually, let's, um, let's show you that uh, if we open the REPL here, we can say, OK, is nil equal to uh, optional dot none? Uh, so, so optionals, I don't want to talk too much about generics in this workshop, but optionals are actually a generic type. So it's a wrapper around uh, any type you like. But um, let's say this is an optional string. And um, so is nil equal to um, optional dot none? Um, sorry. None. That's going to be more impressive. Uh, there you go. So that is true. So nil is just a shorthand for the optional dot none for whatever type you're using. Um, don't worry if that was a bit confusing, but just wanted to 
indulge you there, Tom. Okay, so um, so let's make uh, let's make some function that's going to return an optional. So let's make a function that says uh, the first prime uh, between a minimum uh, and a maximum. And you can see here we're using our our uh, argument labels and parameter names to make the, the signature of this very readable. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to say uh, for, for i in, or for, let's use some proper names, for number in min to max. So here this is another range operator. So before we had dot dot less than, this this that was uh, an exclusive, so it excludes the top end. In this case we're using dot 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 which which includes both ends. So we're going to say for the number in that range if that number dot is prime oops, uh, then return number and again we want to have a return type here of integer um, and if we get through all of the numbers in that range without returning anything then um, then we're going to th there is no value that we can set return so again return nil so actually this return type should be an optional integer right and let's let's test that out down here so um, somebody give me a large number anyone Jacob, give me a large number. <laughs> okay, between twenty-seven thousand and uh, let's say twenty-seven thousand and sixty. Let's see if there's any primes. Uh, okay, uh, let me just get out of this, and then I can do this. Uh, oh, I've made some horrible errors. Um, okay, so I've tried to print an optional, which doesn't actually work. So I'm going to use dump here which is um, a an output mechanism in Swift which will output structured data uh, regardless of the type so it doesn't have to be a string. Uh, let's try that again. Uh, so now we see what we've output here is an optional but it is, so before we saw that an optional is actually an enum so there's two cases in this optional enum, it's either none or it's sum and the sum has an associated value. Okay, and in this case, the associated, va the associated value is two, uh, 2,711 because that is a prime number, according to our program. So if we make this uh, something less than that number, then we'll see that it's actually nil. Okay, do optionals make sense? Cool. Um, so now I want to talk about how we're doing for time. Uh, anyone? What's time? <laughs> Okay, um, I want to talk now about packaging up your Swift code. So this is something that's going to be quite important if you want to write some Swift code uh, outside of iOS or macOS or whatever. Um, you're going to want to have some way to, to distribute it and, and send it around. And Swift actually has uh, a package manager called Swift Package Manager. And that's going to give you a way to make your code distributable. It's going to work alongside Git to figure out uh, versioning of your package. And it's also going to manage things like dependencies, things like building, and it's also going to do some testing for you. So um, a quick disclaimer that Swift Package Manager is very much uh, in active development right now. There's bits that are missing, uh, there's bits that uh, will change over time, and um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to introduce it today because I think it, it will be important in the future of uh, making Swift code outside of the Apple ecosystem. Okay. So let's make uh, a Swift package. So I'm going to go back to uh, our folder here and I'm going to make a new folder. I'm going to call this primes. Um, and we, yeah, so I'm going to make I'm going to make a package out of our primes mechanism that we've that we've just made. Um, so to, to to make a new package in Swift Package Manager, all you do is you type Swift Package in it, and that's going to make a new package for you. Um, let's open this up to see what it's actually created for us. 
So you can see the structure that it's done is um, it's created uh, a package.swift, which is going to describe your package. Uh, so it has a name um, uh, in particular. And it also has a sources folder, which has um, obviously all the source for your module. And it also has a test folder. So you can see it's actually made uh, a bit of a, a test harness for us here. And we'll play with that in a minute. Um, but what we can do once we have a package is we can say swift build. And that's going to build your module. Uh, we can also say swift test. And that's going to run the tests in that test harness that we just looked at. Uh, that's a bit slow. Okay, and you can see those tests uh, that it came with passed with flying colors. Okay, so let's let's make our our uh, primes module. Okay, so we can get rid of this boilerplate stuff, and let's add our extension that we've made to integer. Okay, so was there a, was there a question? So, um, so I'm going to uh, ditch our function here, and uh, you'll see we've forgotten to bring our number class over. So let's do that as well. Okay. So now we have this this all our all our primes functionality bundled up in this one source file. Um, the only thing we do have to add is uh, the public keyword. So earlier on, we were talking about uh, the access control on an extension. So um, we want this to be available to everyone. So we, we just use the, uh, the public keyword. And we'll do that on this one as well. OK, cool. So now if we uh, build that, uh, I've made a mistake. Da -da -da. Method cannot be declared public because its re result uses an internal type. Yeah, so I've also forgotten to make this type public. So I do that, and then we'll be happy. OK, so uh, yeah, let's move on. Any questions so far about Swift Package Manager? Could you show how you'd use that? Yeah, I will do in a minute. I just, yeah, go ahead. Do we need to extension public as well? Um, the the extension so the extension is um, on a public type so the int is a public type so by default the extension is going to be any members of the extension are going to be uh, an internal uh, an internal access control but we've used those public keywords to okay. make those function those public yeah. Would you have to create that pack package skeleton? Like, can you can you do it without having to copy across all of your code? Um, I don't know if there's an easy way to do that because I mean you, you can just you, you can just say swift package in it and then st write your code in there right, yeah. Um, yeah the 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 init function makes it very easy to do it like this go ahead So the question is, how do you modular, modularize your code? It's within your library. Yeah. So, um, so actually, everything within sources is gonna be available to each other, pretty much. Um, you can also have a file private access control if you want something to only be visible to a single file. But by default, um, things, as we say, are of a uh, an internal. Uh, access control, which means everything is accessible across all your source files in this in this in this package. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So let's look at how to use this package. So to prepare your packages for uh, sharing and using elsewhere. Uh, as we say, Swift Package Manager works very closely with Git. So first of all, your package needs to be a Git repository. Um, and then also we need to use the git tags feature uh, in the uh, semantic versioning format, which is a uh, major version, minor version, patch version, um, to indicate the version. Okay, so let's have a look at how we do that. So now we have uh, our, our primes package ready to go. 
we can just say get in it in here to make this a git repository. All right, and then uh, so let's let's add our first commit to this repository. Um, we're just going to say this is our initial commit. Oopsie. Okay, so we've added all our files, and the uh, the Swift package in it command gave us a, a git ignore, so it's not going to include our build files. Um, and then we just need to tag tag the version, as we said. So we're going to say, uh, so for those that don't know what a git tag is, a tag is just a way to refer to a point in the history of a git repository. Okay, it's just it's just a label that you give to a, to a point in the timeline. All right, so to do that, we're going to say git tag. Um, and we're going to give this a version of 0.0.0. Uh, um, what we're going to do is make this an annotated tag, uh, just with that dash a, and then we're going to give this a message, so we can we can talk to our uh, humble user base. We can say first release of primes. Oopsie. Ah. Okay, I'll try that again. I don't think I can use exclamation marks, apparently. Um, okay, so now if we run git tag, we can see that we've we've made this tag. All right, so now this package is ready to be imported elsewhere in other Swift code. So let's have a look. At, let's make a, a new package called uh, import test. All right, um, and we will make this another Swift package. All right, uh, and in this one, we are going to um, we're going to open up our package.swift and add a dependency. So I was saying that Swift Package Manager manages dependencies for you. So let's look at package.swift. Okay, um, the way we do this. So what we've done is we've what, what, what the package manager has done for us with the init script is it's imported a package description. So this is a type that's going to allow us to describe our Swift package. And we are making a new instance of that type here. So we give it a name. We also want to give it a list of dependencies. Uh, dependencies. Uh, so this is an array. And we're just going to add a new package here. And the way we specify a package is we give it a URL. In our case, it's a local package. So we can just go to uh, dot dot slash primes. And, uh, and then we also need to give it a version number. So what we can do is just say, uh, I want anything that's under the major version 0. So with the versioning format that we use, so you know we use that 0.0.0, .0, the idea is that um, no breaking changes will occur when the major version is zero. So that when that number on the left over here is zero, um, any source that's using uh, version zero already will not break when you update to a new version. Go ahead. That's not strictly correct with version zero. You're allowed to do breaking changes oh. with zero. But I want to know about your plan. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so let's now save that. So we've added this dependency to our package. Let's see what happens when we do a Swift build now. So you can see that what it's done is it's cloned the, uh, the package that we made just now, our primes package, and it's recognized that it's at version 0 thanks to our git tag. And then it's compiled both modules. So um, has anyone that's been following along with this, have you managed to do this? Any troubles? OK, cool. So we seem uh, happy with that. So let's check that it's working. So we're going to uh, make um, we're going to make this 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 package, sorry, executable. And the way we do that is we need to add a main.swift file to our sources. So um, the main.swift file is the default entry point to your app. So before you, you saw that we were Swift, we were running Swift build, but then we weren't getting an executable out of it, right? So it's just a, it, the thing that we Swift built only existed as a library. 
When we add a main.swift, we have an entry point for our Swift package so that when we build it, it's actually going to make an executable which starts running at main.swift. <coughs> Does that make sense? Roughly. OK. So let's see what happens. So what we can do is in our source files, we can say uh, import primes because we've added primes to our dependencies. And now we can say uh, 17 dot is prime and we will print that out. See what happens. Uh, if we do swift, uh, swift build. OK, we can see that what it's saying here, linking dot slash dot builds, etc. What, what this is saying is that it's made an executable for us at this location. So we can run that executable. Whoops. We can run that executable just by doing, uh, going to its path. OK, and we can see that 17 is indeed a prime. So I know that's not particularly exciting, but hopefully, um, hopefully that, that, that gives you an insight into how to actually import a package and how to make your own packages that can be, that can be bundled around. Um, cool, so let's, let's also have a quick look. Sorry, I missed, I missed this bit when we were talking about our primes package that we made. But uh, so the package manager made a, te a test harness for us, right? It made this thing which runs when we say Swift test. And we can modify this. So this uses XC test, which is another part of the Swift.org open source project. So XC test is a unit testing framework that's available for Swift code. And what we're going to do is here, obviously, this is not going to work anymore because we don't have primes.swift. But what we do have is um, we can check that one.isPrime whoops uh, is false and we can check that uh, two dot is prime is true and we can do that so if I go back to our primes package then we can run Swift test and it's going to pass those tests so let's see if, it, if we can add one that's going to fail uh, let's say uh, four is pr is prime. Let's let's assert that that's going to be true, and then see that it fails um, fails there. And yeah, so we can see that it failed. Is that cool? So it comes with a, with a test harness that we can we can easily play with. That's uh, that can be a bit fiddly on Linux, so beware that you know it can can get a bit. Um, rocky when you're using the Linux version of that. Yeah, awesome. In that case, it's perfect on both platforms. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, so we've talked about importing other packages. Um, so yeah, you'll notice that this is maybe feeling a little bit uh, clunky at the moment. So if for those of you that have played with Swift in the past using something like Xcode, where we have a lot of auto completion and a lot of um, you know lovely tools, this might seem a bit of a you know step off the beaten track, but this is a very new thing. So as I say, the Swift Package Manager is developing all the time, and better support is no doubt on its way. Go ahead. Uh, going back to the package management, how would we import a package that isn't on our own? Mm -hmm. So we saw that when we added a dependency, so yeah, let's move back to this for a second. When we added a dependency that was local, we said URL equals this URL, which is relative to the root of this, uh, this import test package, right? But if we wanted to make it something else, we would just put, uh, for example, the, the GitHub repository on there. So, um, and we can actually show you, um, I've made some examples of this available for you. If we go to github.com slash hackers at Cambridge uh, slash, well, let's just go, go there for now. Um, then go to Swift examples. So I've made our primes package available on GitHub, so you can play with that if you like. You can add some new features. Um, we also have Swift examples. One of those is import test, which imports it from GitHub. So we use, we use the GitHub URL there, and it's the same versioning mechanism. So it all just runs on Git. OK. Cool. Um, where were we? 
here. So for those of you that do have Xcode available to you, you can uh, create Xcode projects so that you can work with the nice tools that are available in Xcode. So let's go to our, where was it? Our, so for example, our primes package, we could say uh, Swift package generate Xcode proj. And that's going to make an Xcode project for us. And then we can just say, uh, we can open that like that. And let's see what happens. And so this can be a better way to work with your packages if you don't want to use like a, a plain text editor, uh, which might be a little bit cumbersome at times. But obviously it still works outside of Xcode, which is the important thing. So yeah. Um, some noticeable packages that you can play with if you're interested in trying out some packages that are a lot online. Uh, a simple one, Rainbow, gives you uh, colored console output for your Swift code, which is fun. Um, Swifty JSON is nice for passing, passing JSON files. So if you want to write some Swift code that interacts with APIs, maybe you want to write something uh, that plays with, I don't know, the Wikipedia API, then uh, you can pass that JSON, you can make an app that that, I don't know, gives you whatever information you want. Um, Canna is used for passing uh, HTML and XML. I've also made an example of this available. So if you go to Swift Examples, uh, CL Scraper, what you'll see is uh, an example that uses Canna to scrape uh, an HTML page and it's going to give you um, structured information about the, the computer lab staff uh, by scraping the page at uh, the computer lab slash people. Um, okay, so th there's some examples there for you to play with if you're interested. Uh, where were we? And Kitura is a web framework. So um, the whole point of this workshop has been to show you that there is more to Swift than iOS, and Kitura is is almost the culmination of that. In that, you know, Kitura is a web framework, so you can make your web server run on Swift if you so please. Um, it's, it's going places, I promise. <laughs> um, and you can also go to packagecatalog.com, which, um, which is IBM's package catalog for Swift packages. OK. Um, so the other thing is that here's a few resources for you to look at if you are still interested to learn more about Swift. Um, so of course, I've made my examples available on GitHub, but also the Swift programming language is a free ebook by Apple, the designers of Swift, which is the resource for learning Swift, essentially. It, it has, it's very well written, and it contains all the information um, you need to become pretty familiar with the language. Um, there is also the library re reference that I mentioned at the start of this. And there's also a document called the Swift API Guidelines, which will show you how to write really nice, readable uh, Swift code. Like when we were when we were talking about our uh, function signatures and making them read like what we want them to mean, um, that's the sort of thing that is talked about in the Swift API guidelines. And uh, let me just show you where they are. So if you go to uh, swift.org uh, and go to documentation, then you have these design guidelines. And they'll tell you all sorts of ways in which um, you're writing your code wrong, <laughs> and uh, they'll, they'll show you they'll show you these idioms that they think you should use. Okay, um, that is all for me, guys. So thanks very much for listening. <laughs>